Venerable Samanese, Professor Wright, other colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy that I have this opportunity to speak to you. I've spoken many times indeed at these symposia in the very early years, but unfortunately not so often recently. I was certainly here at the inaugural one. It is my duty, I've been requested to introduce the keynote speaker, whom I have had the pleasure, I might say the privilege, of knowing since the mid-1980s. Dr. Fines was first at Leeds University, and if I remember correctly, he studied classics there with an emphasis on Greek. Yes, I think I did. Yes. <laughs> it's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and he had, I think, already, he had been drawn to studying the distant past by his interest in numismatics, uh, which he took extremely seriously. He had a small collection of coins. Uh, to have a large collection demands that one have a lot of coins oneself, but he had a fine small collection of coins, and indeed, while he was with me, his first visit to India was to the Numismatic Congress there. Now, these days, it is really otios to present an audience with a list of the publications of the person one is introducing, because of course all they have to do is to go on Google. Um, but I must just mention a couple of Dr. Fine's achievements, academic achievements. He completed his DPhil at Oxford. Um, it was something that actually spanned more than one faculty, but the title of the DPhil doctorate was Cultural Transmission Between Roman Egypt and Western India. And he completed that in 1991. And of course, one of the examiners had to be a classicist. It was Professor Matthews, the professor of late Roman history. And he made a special point, which was nice of him, but also something in the call of duty, of telling me what a splendid thesis this was. It was quite unusually good. Sometimes people publish their theses but as monographs, but that rather depends on the character of the thesis. And this thesis, of course, covered several topics in different chapters, not all of which were equally suitable for publication. But Dr. Fines did, in fact, publish, I think, two chapters, and he might have published more, perhaps he still will. He, while he was still at Oxford, both before and after taking his doctorate. If I remember correctly, he taught classes in ancient Indian history, including epigraphy, which he had mastered, far outstripping his only real teacher there, who's myself. Um, but he, he taught epigraphy and other skills and branches of knowledge about ancient India, both in classes and in tutorials, and they were extremely appreciated, I can tell you, by the students. But he gradually drifted to some extent into where he is still, not all of him, but a lot of him is now, that is in Jaina studies, when due to some uh, generosity from the Jaina community, and a great deal of hard work from other people, including me, De Montfort University were persuaded to put Jaina studies on the syllabus there, partly with the argument, which I always felt was perhaps not really a very good argument, that there were quite a few Jains living in Leicester, where De Montfort University is situated. 
But anyway, it was Dr. Jain, Dr. Fines who established Jaina studies at De Montfort University, and that was at a time when it really wasn't, it had been part of the offering at SIRS, but at that time it wasn't. And it was really, I think, only at De Montfort University that one could study Jaina studies there. So he was a very important part of the thread of continuity. Before he, I think it was before he actually went to De Montfort University, or maybe immediately after, that he published something in the Oxford World Classics, that is his translation of Hema Chandra's work, Lives of the Jain Elders. And I think that is still print in print, and you can rush out and get it from Amazon. Um, it's 70 pounds now, I think. Well, <laughs> yes. Um, but of course, you're going to tell us about money. <laughs> so maybe. <laughs> maybe. Um, yes, these things are very expensive, but after all, what is more worthwhile? Um, and he then published a translation of an even longer work, uh, the Lilavati Sara of Jina Ratana, which is in a two-volume work published in the Clay Sanskrit Library, CSL, the Clay Sanskrit Library, a work um, of very ornate and indeed sometimes extremely difficult Sanskrit. And I think we managed, of course, Dr. Heinz did 99% of the work, the remaining 1% we battled over the meaning of a few verses and I think we never really solved them, but of course the text may have been corrupt. So uh, those are some of his principal publications, but he taught over a wide range of subjects in De Montfort University and uh, is recognized widely as an authority on Jain, uh, on Jain literature. Um, and you will, it will not have escaped your notice, I'm sure, that of course becoming an expert in these subjects entailed learning a lot of languages. And uh, so, of course, he read giant things, not just in Sanskrit, but also in Prakrit. Well, I think that you're all waiting to hear him, not me. And so, um, I think we're all very grateful to him for coming. Uh, he had a, uh, a diff both of us, as it happened, had very difficult journeys to get here. But uh, anyway, I think we should give him a round of applause and thank you all very much. Um, well, good evening, friends and colleagues. Um, and, and, and thank you, Richard, for that very kind introduction. Um, I, I did actually ask Richard to keep his introduction on the short side, lest his undoubted eloquence unwittingly overshadow um, my following lecture. Um, but but uh, I'm very glad, I, I'm, I, I'm more than glad, I'm delighted that Richard was able to battle over here from Oxford because it gives me the public uh, opportunity, it gives me the opportunity to acknowledge in public um, his profound um, influence um, as a teacher and as a friend on my life and on the lives of many others. Um, I should say uh, a positive influence, I hasten to add. Um, and I think many of you um, will, will recognize that the uh, subtitle of my talk, um, Jainism and Money, Precept and Practice, um, is in fact um, an acknowledgement, a, a, a slight act of homage to, to Richard's own book, Precept and Practice, uh, Traditional Buddhism in the Rural Highlands of Ceylon. Uh, and that book um, has uh, an importance uh, which is far wider than its actual subject matter in that it, can, it actually teaches, well it taught me, how to think about Indology, how to think about India. So that's very important, so I chose the, the subtitle Precept and Practice for that reason. Um, having said that, 
I, I'm not really going to say very much about precept and practice this evening. Um, I thought I would do uh, when I was first invited to give this lecture, but the lecture's actually taken on a different kind of um, pattern, if you like. Um, and I should, before I kick off, obviously I, I need to uh, acknowledge the honour, uh, you know, and the privilege. It's a great honour to be, to be invited to present the 19th Annual Regina Lecture before such a, a distinguished, very distinguished, a knowledgeable audience. And despite what Richard said, I, I, I do wish to stand here and present myself as an expert on Jainism. Um, I, I'm rather someone who has found inspira inspiration in the riches of, of a Jain cultural tradition and who wants to explore more and to learn more about it. So I, I stand here uh, in humility, if you like, and I'm hoping to be able to learn more as we proceed through the workshop tomorrow. Um, so, um, so much for Jainism. Uh, now regarding money, um, my, di my direct experience of it is extremely limited. <laughs> I, I, I know very little about, about money. I, I rarely have the opportunity to handle it. But um, nevertheless, uh, from my standpoint as an outsider on both counts, um, I hope to be able to offer just a few insights in this lecture, which I hope may be of interest. And, of course, it's not possible to give a full historical account of this big topic, Jainism and money. But um, I'm going to offer just a few insights, but I think the key insight that I'm going to develop, that I'm going to touch on, is the fact that I believe that money helps shape the Jain universe. Many help shape the Jain universe, and in turn, the Jain universe shapes Jain attitudes towards many. And this will become clear uh, as we go through it. And I begin by showing two very familiar images. And uh, I'm sure everybody here uh, you know, knows, knows um, what this is. This is Mahavira, um, the 24th and, and last Tertankra of, of the present era, and he is standing in the Kayat um, Saga posture, um, the posture of uh, ascetic meditation, and as such, he exemplifies the key Jain ideals of Ahimsa and um, Aparigraha. Uh, Aparahimsa, uh, Ahimsa, as you all know, the principle of non violence and non harming. Uh, a principle of behavior which is extended to all sentient beings, and Aparigraha, the absence of possessiveness, um, the complete, uh, in the aesthetic ideal, the complete lack of possessions, both physical and mental. And Mahavira, in this image, is a complete exemplar of these ideals. He is a jinnah. He's one who has gained victory by conquering the passions of desire, hatred, and greed, and pride, and has limit, uh, liberated himself from the bonds of existence, the continuous continu cycle of death and existence, death and rebirth. Um, so the second image, which uh, uh, there's another version of this, which is serving, as, as, as I think, on the logo of, of, of this, um, uh, of this uh, workshop, uh, it's, it's also a Jain image, but very different from the first. Um, this is Kubera, the god of wealth. He's actually an exemplar of possession, completely the opposite to Mahavira. He's an example of taking more than what is needed, a point emphasized by his round belly, you know, completely full, satiated. There's no self-denial in this image, and his possession of wealth in the form of money, is made explicit by, he's got a money bag, he's holding a money bag in his left hand and a pomegranate in the other, and he's seated on an elephant, I think you can just see, who is rather being flattened by his weight, uh, you know, his, his sort of fullness, so, so there you go. He, now the point is that 
uh, Kubra is a pan-Indian god, but he is fully incorporated into the Jain pantheon and also into the uni universe. So the point is, the, the god of wealth incorporated into the Jain universe is actually an, atten an attendant protective deity of the 19th Tertankra Mali. And the, the, the Jain universe, as most of you here, I'm sure nearly all of you uh, will know, is worked out in very minute detail. And in a moment or two, I'll, I'll touch on the role of many in its um, development. So these two images um, typify the key themes of this um, conference or workshop, Jainism and Money. And we, we can see there's um, uh, an apparent dichotomy, an apparent dichotomy between the ascetic uh, ideal of Jainism and the wealth of the Jain lay community, both in the past and at the present time. Now, um, I, I, I must hasten to add that not all individual Jains are wealthy, but I, I think no one would dispute the validity of the um, generalisation. But perhaps we ought to step back and, and consider, not only for this lecture, but for, the, um, for tomorrow as well, what money actually is. Um, money is not the same as wealth. Um, a person may be wealthy in terms of property, houses, land, for instance, but relatively poor in terms of money. Uh, there is, of course, a tight relationship between the two. Um, I'd like to quote um, a passage from uh, William Desmond, uh, who wrote in Magic, Myth and Money in 1962, The Origin of Money in Religious Ritual. Um, to many of us, money is a mystery, a symbol hand handled mainly by the priests of high finance. In re regard, and regarded by us with, us with much of the same reverence and awe as a primitive feels towards the sacred relics providing magical potency in a tribal ritual. Understood and only controllable by the magic of brokers, accountants, lawyers and financiers. Like spellbound savages in the presence of the holy, we watch in wonder the solemn proceedings, feeling a, in a vague, somewhat fearful way but our lives and the happiness of our children are at the mercy of mysterious forces beyond our control. Well, that's a fine quotation. And while deploring the, the, the somewhat racist undertones of a Freudian primitivism, implicit in that quotation, um, as someone who has endeavoured to make a living as an academic for nearly 40 years, I do have a certain empathy with it. Um, I mean, it, it is, of course, very unusual for an academic to have direct experience of money, unless one becomes uh, vice-chancellor of one of the new universities, or, or perhaps a media buffoon. Uh, but, 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 but in those cases, one is not primarily operating as, a, as an academic. Um, but I'm making a serious point. Um, the world of money and finance seems to have become the new exotic for academics working in the humanities. Um, and perhaps my lecture and tomorrow's workshops are instances of this fascination with this strange and somewhat frightening world. And, and this is a point which has been made recently by Nigel Dodd um, in his um, Social Life of Money, uh, published by Princeton. And uh, my understanding of what money is has been uh, enriched by the work of Dodd, and I acknowledge my debt to him, so note the appropriateness of the metaphors, which we you know run through the lecture. Um, so there's no one definition of money, and it is a protean in its forms, but its existence certainly lies in social relations, um, social relationships, and that's perhaps a truism. The forms of money have changed and continue to change. Um, as a numismatist, I am familiar with the concept of coins, originally made from gold and silver, 
having stamps that authorise their acceptance and circulation. But today, coins are only used for very low transactions. For higher tra value transactions, we use banknotes. But for really large amounts, the money we use is intangible and invisible, moved by the click of a mouse. And of course, now we have cryptocurrencies, such as Bitcoin, which were touted as being open and democratic, but now seem to be even more subject to fraud and speculation than traditional currencies. Modern money is invisible and it's, it can be created by banks out of nothing, out of debt, out of something that is negative. So money exists in social relations, but this does not imply equality in the relationships. Um, those who have power can change the rules as to what constitutes money to the disadvantage of those who were not previously in the know. Um, for instance, we know that in India, towards the end of 2016, I think, the government withdrew, uh, I think it was 500 and 1,000 rupee notes, to the obvious disadvantage of those who were able to change them. Mm. And of course, governments mismanage their economies to such an extent that their currencies become virtually worthless, causing great hardship to the mass of the population, where while the elites have access to hard currency, which is in itself an interesting phrase, hard currency, uh, usually in the form of US dollars. So um, there's a process of inequality here, which is obvious, and it's something that uh, I do know that um, it's something that is being addressed within the Jain tradition. Uh, we're very fortunate that uh, Atul Shah is with us and will, will be speaking tomorrow and we can hear more about uh, how Jain traditions and, um, are sort of being brought to impact on this imbalance. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to finish uh, by, by coming back to Atul's work. Where, where is Atul? Hi. Good. So, one of the reasons I was invited to give this lecture, I think, uh, was that I participated in a research project which was led by Richard Seaford, who's now Professor Emeritus of Classics and Ancient History at the University of Essex. And the, 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 name, the, under, um, the name of the, the title of the project was um, Artman and Psyche, Cosmology and the Self in Ancient India and Ancient Greece. And what Richard Se Seaford aimed to do was to apply his theories uh, regarding the role of money in early Greek society to Indian society and culture as it was developing in the time of Mahavira and the Buddha. Now, what these two societies have in common, had, had in common, was growing urbanization. Um, the development of the Greek city-states was roughly um, contemporary with urbanization in the Ganges Valley. And Richard Seaford's key um, idea um, is that both civilizations uh, embrace oneness, if you like, as opposed to multiplicity. A single, all-embracing, formless entity is elevated above multiplicity, change, and the reason for this is the um, rapid spread of coined money. He argues that Greek philosophers arrived at the idea of a world as a single substance underlying the plurality of sensible things by projecting unconsciously the substance of monetary value onto the cosmos. And he also argues that the spread of coined money in India led to the development of the idea of samsara conditioned by karma. Now, I don't find this thesis convincing um, because whatever you might think of, about the, mechanic, uh, the mechanics of unconscious projection as an explanation for change, the theory will not work for India for the reason that the idea of samsara conditioned by karma seems to have originated in India 
prior to the widespread use of coined money. Um, however, the use of coined money did take off in the Ganges plain during the lifetime of the Buddha and towards the end of the life of Mahavira and his, the lives of his successors. And its use must have led to profound social and cultural changes. Um, I think we've got... Oh yes, that's Richard Seaford's book if you want to uh, take a note of that. Uh, it, it is Money and the Early Greek Mind. Uh, but the... Um, universe and the inner self in the in early Indian and early Greek thought series of essays uh, also um, edited by Richard Seaford if you want to follow through on these points. Um, but yes, uh, these are the uh, earliest um, coins to be produced in India that they're now called by numismatist punch mark coins because as you can see they have they're a thin piece of silver with of a standard weight with various punches applied to them. Um, various symbols, we, we don't know what they mean, but um, they've been assigned to various towns and uh, countries uh, attested in the literary sources. But um, they were produced at, uh, they were produced in the lifetime of the Buddha, and here we've got uh, a hoard of coins uh, from a time of the, of the Mauryan dynasty. And these coins were produced in huge quantities, massive quantities. Um, one of the people who've studied these, um, a man called Hardacre, said that they were, in their time, perhaps even more plentiful than the Roman denarius, judging from the numbers that survive today, that they survive in very large uh, quantities. And um, in 2015, I um, wrote a paper um, which um, looked at the impact of coined money on early Buddhism and I argued that for the Buddha and for early Buddhism money was morally neutral. Um, on the one hand uh, it's um, as a circular mate, as a, it's correct use as a circulating medium, can generate merit uh, when it's used for proper donations, when it's used in the right way. On the other hand, its abstraction from circulation can be a, cord, a cause of greed and attachment. And I also argued that money as a circulating medium had a weakening effect on formerly hierarchical relationships. Uh, it, it, impacted on the social relationships of the lay supporters of early Buddhism, facilitated the making of donations, and was clearly uh, an enabling factor in the foundation of some early um, Buddhist institutions. But we know rather less about its impact on Jainism at such an early period in the 5th century BC. Um, but it seems clear, perhaps, I'm not sure, uh, what Mahadeva would have thought of money. He would have taken, I don't think he would have regarded it in quite the same light as of the Buddha. I think he would have taken a rather dim view of it, uh, regarding it as he would all possessions, as being something to be abandoned by those who want to escape from the bonds of samsara, um, the perpetual cycle of death and rebirth. And he, I think he would take the view, would have taken the view that it would encourage greed and possessiveness. But we get clearer evidence um, from um, Jainism, Jains and their relationship with money from the west of India and in a slightly later period. Uh, the western satraps or the western satrapas are perhaps not so well known a dynasty as the Mauryas or the Gupta, but as a Guptas, but their polity seems to have been remarkably stable. They lasted a long time. Uh, they ruled the west of India from about 35 AD to about 40, 405 AD, a remarkably long period. And their prosperity was based on trade, internal trade, but also trade across the Indian Ocean. And here we get the importance of Jain merchants 
who are travelling across the Indian Ocean uh, into um, from um, the, from Broach, uh, from Barbaricum, etc., and they are trading in. Um, they are exporting um, gemstones, cotton, spices, copper, hardwoods, and what was coming back was silver. Huge quantities of silver, and these were uh, turned into coins by the Western satraps, and these survive in massive quantities. Here we can see um, some of the trade routes. Um, and I think what, what the point I'm trying to make here is that Jainism at this time is not something isolated or inward-looking. Jain merchants are they're a worldwide force, if you like. Uh, there's a lot of interplay of ideas communication that's, um, that, um, that's taking place here. Um, so one of the key points, we, we can find Jane influence and um, I'm just, oh yes, here are some of the early uh, Western Satrap coins um, survive in large quantities. Um, this is a map showing um, the distribution of um, Indian red polished ware in the early centuries AD. And this, uh, taken in conjunction with the previous map of the trade routes, shows that there are contacts going from uh, south, the south of India into the Persian Gulf. You can see that. And it is at this period that we find Jain influences in other religions. Um, I wrote a paper, probably when I was at my peak in 1996, on um, plant souls in Jainism and, and Manichaeism. And the Manichaean idea that some forms of vegetable life have sentient souls that can feel pain seems to originate from contact with Jain merchants at this time. Um, and the, there's a shared injunction to both Jain, um, to Jain monks and to the Manichaean elects to avoid walking on living plants. And I think that this is something that it's part of, um, I'm going to come back to money in a moment, but the dietary habits of the Jain merchants, which must, must have been there for all to see, become part of the currency of ideas at the time. But I turn now from the talking to about actual merchants to the ideal. I mean, I've shown pictures of many, and Jane merchants, Jane lay people, were in possession of this money. So what we really think we need to do is to, to consider how this money is viewed in the, within the Jane tradition. And this is where we, 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 we think about the second image I showed, Kubra, the god of wealth, and that becomes relevant. So there is a text which does um, give us some information. Uh, the Aparsaka Dasha, the, the seventh Anga of the Shvetambra tradition, which recounts the exemplary, the, the lives of ten exemplary lay people. Now, the defining characteristic of all ten is their great wealth. They're not just wealthy, they're hugely, hugely rich. Now, eventually, they all renounce their wealth and undertake voluntary restraints of increasing severity. And in the end, they seem virtually indistinguishable from um, advanced professed Jain monks. And um, the first of these the Jain lay people to be described in this text is Ananda, uh, who, who was a highly respected householder uh, who lived uh, in the time of Mahavira. And his wealth is, this is an important point I want to make, his wealth is described in monetary value. He had a hoard of 40 million gold coins buried in a safe place. 
40 million gold coins lent out at interest, 40 million gold coins invested in agriculture. The, and then, thus the text tells us, um, his total wealth was 120 million golden coins, and he had um, 40,000 cows as well. So, his wealth is carefully enumerated, and enumeration and calculation is a theme I want to pick up as, as I go into the lecture. So, one day, Ananda went to hear Mahavira preach, and you can see him in this uh, modern illustration. He, he's convinced by the truths of the, the Jain religion, and we, without becoming a monk, gradually began to limit the use of his wealth and to, to renounce it, eventually handing over his business activities to his son. I mean, the business activities continued, you know, he's not going to put, put an end to it. So, of course, his great wealth makes his renunciation of it all the more impressive, you know, if he only had, you know, a few pounds, you know, it's not really, you know, sort of perhaps worth writing about. And his wealth guarantees his personal probity, on which, um, on which is based the respect he receives from others. And later on, this concept of probity uh, it became known by the Persian word arbru, and it becomes a key theme in Jain mercantile life. So, there's certainly a place for money in the textual tradition of the Shvetan for Jains, and it's good to have a lot of it, but it's even better to renounce it. So, given that it is there, um, what is its place in the scheme of things? And I mean scheme of things in the sense of the Jain universe, which, in which I'm sure you all know the Jain universe is worked out in meticulous detail and everything has its due place. So let's think about its origins. Well, money was among the gifts of civilization which were bestowed upon mankind by Rishabha, uh, the first Tatankra of the present era, while he was king, that is, and it's important that he did this while he was king because he wouldn't do this after he took uh, renunciation. And um, there's a, a, a very good account of this given by uh, Jinnasena, um, a 9th century Digambra Acharya, uh, in the Adi Purana, um, his biography of Rishabha. But I, I'm going to follow the version given by Hema Chandra, um, probably because I'm, I'm familiar with Hema Chandra. But um, Hema Chandra, the, the, the 12th century Shvetambra Acharya, uh, known as the all-knowing one of the present degenerate age. So, according to Hema Chandra, um, Rishabha established civilization. He taught human beings the use of fire, how to cook, agriculture, the crafts of pottery, carpentry, painting, weaving, etc. He also established bulk weights in objects and, and gems. And we're also told that he also established the junction of the four roads in the city of law of the world, conciliation, bribes, dissension, and force. Hema Chandra goes on to say that at that time, extreme selfishness of people arose, saying, that is my father, mother, brother, son, wife, etc. So, why did Rishabha need to do this? Why did he need to um, teach human beings the arts of civilization? Um, the answer is because of the passing of time. The answer is because of the nature of the, of the universe, the way things are. Um, and that's Hema Chandra, that's an illustration of him. Um, um, most of you are familiar with the... Um, perpetual cycle, the perpetual passing of time, how the, the, there's a continuous cycle which um, in a series of spokes things start off very well um, and gradually degenerate and then they come at a time and they, things get um, generally better once again and um, this process uh, has never been created, it's just the universe, it's just the way things are. 
So Hema Chandra, uh, when he's describing Rishabha, is placing Rishabha and money in the context of the universe. Now, there was a time when things are really, really good, uh, when all human beings' needs were granted by wishing trees and human beings lived for a very, very long time. Um, they were very, very tall and there was no need for civilization because everything came from the wishing trees. But shortly after Rishabha's birth, the world, uh, the spokes turned, the universe, the world, uh, well, the part of the universe, to be more precise, where this operates, um, became slightly worse, the wishing trees, trees stopped working, and human beings needed to fend for themselves, and they didn't know what to do. So Rishabha had to tell them. So the point is that um, money is not there as a result of people's greed or for any sinfulness, it's just there because people need it, and it's there in the universe because of the way the universe is. Um, I chose um, Hema Chandra's account not um, for any disrespect to Jinnasena, because it, but because it's part of the, the universal history, his lives of the 63 great people, uh, translated into six stout volumes by the American scholar Helen Johnson, and more recently, issued in a, uh, a condensed form as Sir Jane Saga, which is uh, freely avail um, available. So, okay, money has its origin in, and its place in the unfolding of events and also in the Jane conception of the universe. The Jane universe is finite but of immense size. Its measurements and its geography are calculated in, gray, in great detail, and a lot of text describing the Jain universe and its measurements. Uh, and there's a fascination with the minutely small and the mind bogglingly large. And uh, these, um, there's the uh, schematic um, representation of the Jain universe. Many of you, most of you, are, I, I think, are familiar with this. And then you, you find the one. Um, in the in human form, and you can see the various calculations at the side. Um, Western scholars um, often tend to concern themselves with um, matters of attribution and style when uh, commenting on these illustrations, and, and don't really concern themselves with the calculations. Yet these are the things which I argue are important as being indicative of, of, a, merc of a, a mercantile mentality, um, a mentality in which calculation, the making up of huge amounts from small units, as we saw with Ananda's fortune, measured in these sort of individual pieces of gold, but you've got a huge amount altogether, um, that the calculation of profit, uh, of interest over time, all these facets of calculations are echoed in the description and the formulation of the, of the Jain universe. So my argument here is that the mercantile mentality, and many in particular, shape the Jain conception of the universe. And I can show proof. Uh, proof can be found in texts dealing with um, calculation and arithmetic. Uh, in particular, one text in particular I want to refer to, and I think I've got the, an illustration of it, which is the um, Ganitasara Sangraha of Mahavira Acharya, Mahavira Acharya. And this is um, uh, the author of this text, mathematical text, the epitome of the essence of calculation. Uh, it's a high-ranking Digambra Jain monk, um, living in the, the Canada-speaking region of southern India, writing about the middle of the ninth century. Um, he, he's attached to, had some relationship to the, to the court 
of one of her Rashtrakuta uh, kings. And the late, according to the late David Pingree, uh, this is the earliest text on, the earliest Sanskrit text on mathematics to have survived in its entirety. Um, the text and English translation um, were first published by M. Rangacharya in 1912 and recently republished by Cosmo Publications. I need to take some water. Recently republished by Cosmo Publications. Um, so Mahavira Acharya <coughs> makes explicit the link between calculation and the universe. In fact, the universe is calculation. In his opening salutation to Mahavira, the 21st Tertankara, Mahavira Acharya says, I bow to the Lord of the Jinnas, by whom, as forming the shining lamp of the knowledge of numbers, the whole universe has been made to shine. And in his first chapter he says, What is the good of saying much in vain? Whatever there is in the three worlds, which are possessed of moving and non-moving beings, all that indeed cannot exist as apart from measurement. Now, the relationship between Mahavira's mathematical processes and the construction of the Jain universe has been discussed by uh, Catherine Morris Singh in a very learned and important article. And it's published in the International Journal of China Studies, uh, 13. So she's talking about the treatment of series um, and how um, it's basically to do with the calculation of the expanding um, ring of oceans and continents. And um, she makes a point that by choosing such a model for the cosmos, Jane thinkers succeeded in combining seemingly contradictory ideas, like, on the one hand, a vastness which is beyond our imagination, and on the other hand, irregularity and perfect command over the calculations which is maintained in all circumstances. Now, that is very true, but I would like to sort of take this down to a slightly lower level and suggest that the process of calculation which forms the universe is based on a mercantile ethic and on money in particular. And this is made explicit by Mahavira Acharya in the examples he gives to illustrate his calculations. Now, in the text were lots of problems, things to be worked out, sums to be done, and the text is replete with merchants borrowing and lending money, calculating profit and loss, and calculating the value of joins uh, of gold and gems. For instance, there were six merchants the elder one among them gave uh, in order, out of what they respectively had on hand, to those who were next younger to them, exactly two-thirds of what they respectively had on hand. Afterwards, they all became possessed of equal amounts of money. What were the amounts of money they each had on hand to start with? That's one problem. Okay, here's another. So... Three pieces of gold, of three each in weight, and of two, th three and four varnas respectively, are added to an unknown weight of gold of 13 varnas. Uh, varna, meaning colour, is a measure of the purity of gold. There are 16 varnas usually. The resulting varna comes out to be 10. Tell me, friend, the measure of the unknown weight of gold. So that's a problem to do with the working out of gold. Now, uh, the mercantile ethic 
in informing this work is obvious. So, uh, and do bear in mind that this is not a layperson who, who's writing this work. This is a high-ranking um, Jane Acharya, uh, a Jane monk. So, this interdependent um, connection uh, between money, calculation, and the mapping of the universe uh, is epitomised in, in the life and work of uh, Takura Peru, who was active at the court of the Delhi Sultans in the 13th century. And his spiritual leader was Jinnachandra Suri, uh, leader of the Karatagacha from about 1248 to 1319. Uh, we know that Takara participated in pilgrimages. He was um, active at a time when minting of coins uh, under the Delhi Sultans was largely controlled by Jains. And he was an expert on assaying. He was, uh, became assay master in the Sultan's mint. And he wrote various texts, in mainly in Upper Bramshire. And he wrote a book on the testing of metals. Uh, he wrote uh, a text on um, so, um, calculation. And he also wrote works on astronomy and astrology. And also on gemology. And gemology, uh, I think we'll be hearing something about gems uh, and, and the diamond trade this, uh, this weekend. Gems were important for trade, uh, for Jains, who traded them as a store of value and also, also as a closed system of circulation. They knew the value and exchange them among themselves, but you had to have knowledge um, of, the, of the system to, to um, find out about it. Um, here we've just got one of these works, and I, I choose just, a, well, not at random, but I, I choose uh, Takura as an exemplar of these links between uh, the mercantile ethos, between money, between calculation, between somebody who's working um, on uh, assaying, measuring, but is also interested in um, astronomy, astrology. So this is a kind of mentality, if you like, of somebody who's actually controlling, um, largely involved in, in controlling coinage, the issue of money in, in uh, the um, 13th and early 14th century. So there is a very large literature, as, as we move on a little bit in time, there's a very large literature on banking, coinage and commerce uh, during the Mughal Empire and also on the East India Company and the development of mercantile capitalism. So. I think it's worth highlighting for a moment uh, the role of Jains in the development of international mercantile systems and in early capitalism. Jains were active in this, and perhaps uh, the genre of, of world history is becoming very fashionable. Uh, people are, are working more and more into taking um, a long time span over a large geographical space. And I think that it's important that the, the Jain ideal if, is given due credit for its impact, especially on uh, early mercantile capitalism. And as, a, as an example of this, we, we, there's a, we can think of uh, Jagat Sait. Uh, his family were uh, Mawawi. Oswald Jains, originating in Rajasthan, uh, but they moved to Bengal in the late 17th century. And uh, he uh, was, his original name was Fateh Chand, and he controlled the money market of the Mughal Empire in the early 18th century, and he was given by the emperor the title Jagat Sait in 1722. He was in charge of the minting of coins and he controlled the market in silver bullion. And he was necessarily involved in politics and European trading companies depended on him for loans and he died in 1744. Um, the fate of his descendants, uh, 
well, due to political reasons, which I, I don't want to go into, uh, the, 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 uh, his descendants were able to emulate uh, his lifestyle or his prestige. But Jacket Set had an opulent lifestyle. Uh, his house um, is now a museum, but he, uh, his riches are exemplified in his house, but he was, uh, he, his life was informed by the prestige that he earned, so he was necessarily a generous patron, donating funds for the repair and upkeep of Jain temples, of festivals, and what's really interesting is that he sponsored the copying of manuscripts of which he was a collector. And we, we see some of his manuscripts in the museum. And I was very much hoping to um, have, uh, to, to be able to access the catalogue of, of these manuscripts, right, which I'm sure much I, m m must exist somewhere. But, but I have not been able to do so. It would be fascinating. I'm sure there are texts here about, must be texts about uh, calculation, also about the universe, I suspect, but I'm not sure. His house, now a museum. But the point I, I'm just using, uh, this, uh, I could multiply the instances uh, of Jane merchants who were fully involved in the development of early mercantile capitalism in the 18th century, just as Jain businessmen and, and bankers were fully involved in the development of modern capitalism and the financial systems that underpin it. Um, it's not uh, possible to, for me to follow through at this point. Um, now, for anybody speaking about money, um, finance, it's obligatory to mention 2008. I've mentioned it. I've got it. Um, so, one of the consequences of, 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 of the financial crash of that year has been an increase in, well, in utopian suggestions for the reform of, and, and, in, and in some cases, the abolition of money. Uh, the work of Nigel Dodd, we, we, we saw, um, we saw the book earlier on, and of David uh, Graeber of Occupy Wall Street and the anti-capitalist conversion are examples of this. And Jains are contributing to this debate as well they should. And um, the, the Jain contribution has been situated within Jain values, obviously, and I discussed at the start of this lecture the principle of non-possessiveness. And a key example of this is the work of Atul Shah here, here with us. And I think we have the, yeah, um, Atul's. I'm sure you've all seen this book and you'll hear more about it tomorrow. Uh, his ethical, Jainism and ethical finance written with Adrian Rankin, uh, a timeless business model. Um, so. I don't need to discuss this at length, and uh, I certainly wouldn't dream of, of, of doing so, upstaging at all. But what I find particularly significant is its situation of financial reform in the setting of the Jain universe. So uh, on page 79 uh, in a chapter called Obligation and Interdependency, we read, all parts of the Jain universe work together. In their interaction makes the cosmos a unified whole. The idea of interconnectedness is binding on human institutions, including commercial enterprises, communities and households. Um, this perspective has a direct bearing on the commercial activities of many lay Jains for whom effective business is an extension of balanced household uh, management. So, this theme of um, interconnectedness um, underlines a key point um, I think I've made, because I'm going to finish now almost, um, is that money and the mercantile ethic shape the Jane universe, and the Jane universe in turn shapes Jane ideas about money. And 
Jane ideas continue to impact on the current debate about the nature of money and on finance. Um, just to, there's one thing I'd like to, to conclude on. Um, Nigel Dodd uh, briefly discusses the anthropological literature on calculation. All the examples he gives are taken from Western situation, Western examples. So um, I think, I hope I've shown that Jane calculation is clearly a rich field ripe for exploration, not only by anthropologists, but also by economics and social historians, uh, as are Jane ideas about money and finance. Um, so in conclusion, I, I'd just like to say that I hope I've managed to give some idea of the riches that await further exploration, not exploitation. Thank you very much.